Okay, we're going to continue through Matthew 20, well, Matthew's Gospel. We're in Matthew 23. Uh, remember last couple of times we were looking at the uh, end of 22. Uh, you had three groups of people come to Jesus, ask Him a question. Then He turns around and asks them a question. Um, now we turn to Matthew 23. This is a pretty intense chapter. Um, it's packed with warnings. It's packed with woes. And it's packed with weeping. Warning, woes, and weeping. Matthew 23, warning, woes, and weeping. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Uh, we see Jesus warns the crowd and his disciples. And then in verses 13 through 36, you see Jesus denounces the scribes and Pharisee in the form of seven woes. And then in verses 37 through 39, you see Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. So that's the structure of chapter 23. Warnings, woes, weepings. Uh, chapter 24 starts the Olivet Discourse, which is a pretty intense uh, two chapters, too. So the next three chapters in Matthew are intense. So we begin that today. Let's go uh, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. But not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their flactories broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by, by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, if you have one teacher. And you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Verses 1 through 7, we see Jesus exposes hypocrisy. Verses 8 through 12, we see he exalts humility. So we see the contrast between hypocrisy and humility. Let's look again at verses 1 through 7 and see how Jesus is exposing hypocrisy. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. So right here, we, who's Jesus talking to? Crowds and his disciples. Okay, Not until verse 13 does he turn and start talking to the Pharisees and the chief priests. Okay, Right here, he's talking to the crowds and the disciples. It's important that we recognize that. He's saying, pay attention to, he said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works they do. When teaching the Word, for the scribes and Pharisees, it would have been what? The Old Testament. Amen? When teaching the Word, it is important that one stays on the line. Follow me here. Not above the line, adding to the Word. The Word is the line. They're not to go above the line and add to it, and they're not to go below the line and take from it. Okay? Just stay on the line. Say what it says and let it be. See, we see the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus is saying that there's two issues here. They add to it, they go above the line, and they take from it. So I want to show you what, he, what he's doing, what, how they do that. It's important to stay on the line of Scripture. Simply say what it says and leave it be. He shows us that the, before he shows us that they add to the line and then take away from the line, or they add to the scripture, they take away from the scripture, he does say that they know the line exists and occasionally they stay on it. Because he says, look at him, he says, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you. So, He's saying that there are times where what they're teaching is in line with the Word. 
There's a sense here that sometimes they taught precisely what Moses taught. So what Jesus is guarding against here is he's warning them not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. When they sit on Moses' seat and they start teaching, to pay attention to what they're teaching. This gives us evidence that we have to know the Word of God ourselves so that we can determine what somebody is saying is legit or what somebody is saying is not legit. we got to know the Word. And that's what he's kind of saying here. He's saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater with everything that they say. He doesn't give a blanket approval here for everything they taught, but he is saying, pay attention, observe, so that you know what is legit and what is not legit. If they speak God's truth, he says, you should do and observe it. It's the Word of God. It's still the Word of God, even if it's coming out of the mouth of hypocrites. Amen? It's a great example of knowing the importance and knowing the Word of God. It shows us the importance. We have to know it so that we can distinguish the difference between tr truth and error. Now, so he says, pay attention. you got to know it. Observe it. They are in these positions, and you have to know the words so you can distinguish between the difference. Now he exposes their hypocrisy in verse 3. And he shows how they go below the line. They take away from it. But not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. Their disobedience communicates that the line isn't worth keeping, i.e. they take away from the line. Their disobedience shows that, it's not, that the line's not worth keeping and they can do whatever they want to do, and they go below the line, and they, they believe that to be acceptable. So he's exposing their hypocrisy here. So they go below the line by just simply saying, ah, you don't need to keep the, the, the rules, you don't need to obey it, we don't. So they go below the line, they take away from Scripture by simply teaching that disobedience is okay. Danger. They go above the line. Verse 4. This is where he spends most of his time here. They go above the line. They add to Scripture. How do they do that? Verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Heavy burdens. What is he talking about? What kind of heavy burdens is he talking about? That they tie up and lay on people's sh shoulders. He's not talking about r physical burdens that he's putting on people's shoulders and they're walking around with, with weights on their shoulders. What he's talking about are all the man-made legal traditions that the Jews, the Israelites, the, the scribes, Pharisees, religious elite, chief priests, they add to the Word of God. They have all these laws, all these things that they've created in an attempt to obey the Word. But what they've done is with all these man-made rules, they've elevated them to the same level as the Word of God and then teach it as if it was God's law, God's Word. Some examples include around the Sabbath. We had talked about this months ago when we were early, when, earlier in Matthew. One of the things they did was a tailor couldn't carry a needle on the Sabbath lest he would be tempted to sew something that was ripped. Remember, you can't work on the Sabbath. They took it a step further. A tailor can't even carry a needle because he'll be tempted if something's ripped to sew it. That's an example. A student couldn't carry his books on the Sabbath because he might read them. Can't read. Student works. Reading would be work. You can't even carry a book. Another example. Cold water could be poured on warm water, but warm water couldn't be poured on cold. Here's another one. You couldn't take a bath on the Sabbath for fear that water would spill onto the floor, and by wiping it up, that's considered cleaning and working, so you couldn't even take a bath. Okay, so this is the kind of burdens that they've laid on the people that Jesus is talking about here. These man-made legal religious traditions became overwhelmingly unbearable to anyone to keep. So what are they doing here? They're adding to the line. They're adding more to the Scripture. Adding to the line. I mean, that's just, I mean, think about how crushing that is. I think some of us have had experience in, some, in these kinds of things, that fundamentalist type of um, religion that adds so much weight 
on to us. That's why Jesus says, I think in Matthew 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. Not the Pharisees and the scribes. Their yoke unbearably hard and heavy. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All right, so one through four, we see Jesus showing us um, how they're adding and taking away from the line of Scripture. Verses five through seven. Now Jesus reveals to the crowds and his disciples the hearts of the scribes and Pharisees. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their flactories broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in all the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Their hearts are motivated by exalting themselves. They love the good seats. They love the greetings. Um... So you notice these verses, Jesus is talking about two things with these Pharisees and and the scribes here. What they love and what they do. Let's look at what they do first. Notice the word all. Man, man, this is a hard rebuke. They do all. their deeds to be seen by others. All of their actions are polluted with pride. All of their actions, all of the things they do come from a heart that desires to exalt themselves. All. That's a massive word. Even how they dress. They make their flactories broad and their fringes long. So why? To be seen by others. What in the world is a flactory? A flactory is a small, sometimes small, leather box containing passages of Scripture which are worn on the forehead and on the left arm. Small leather boxes containing passages of Scripture to remind the people of that person's faithfulness to the law, to the Word. Look how big my flactory is. What do you think that communicates? I know the Word and I obey. My flactory is bigger than your flactory because I know and obey the Word more than you do. Look at how big my flactory is. Same thing with the fringes. Fringes or tassels were blue or white cords worn on the four corners of the hem of the robe, the outer robe that they would wear. So they got these tassels, right? The longer the tassel, right, the, that communicates the more the person obeys the Word of God. My flactory and my tassel. And, I, and I, so that, what's their heart? They're putting these things on so that people see, wow, man, that dude is holy. He knows the Word. He obeys the Word of God. So that's what they do. What do they love? Before we talk about what they love in verse 6, I want you to think about the psalmist in Psalm 119. What's the psalmist in Psalm 119 love? The Word. He loves the Word. Not the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces being called rabbi by others. So what they love is the praises of men. That's what this is here. They love the praises of men. Which which manifests itself in sitting in places of honor at feasts, which would be near to the host, right? Closest to the host. Um, It manifests itself by best seats in the synagogues, which would be front row seats closest to the speaker. A verbal respect given by other people. Greetings in the marketplaces. Not casual greetings like, hi, how you doing? But like bowing down and kissing their ring. That kind of stuff. And then being called rabbi by others. Love it. Title, love it. 
That's what they love. Not the word like Psalm, like the psalmist in Psalm 119. It's a matter of the heart. So Jesus right here in verses 1 through 7, he exposes hypocrisy. Now what he's going to do in 8 through 12, he exalts humility. The contrast is intentional. The contrast is intentional. But you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So to stop feeding into the religious self-exaltation, Jesus says you are not to be called rabbi or instructor. Or don't call any man father. So instead of elevating his disciples above one another, or above the crowd, by giving them some title that leads them to think they are all that in a bag of potato chips, instead of giving them a title to elevate them above the crowd, he does the opposite. You are all brothers servants. He does the opposite of elevating them with a title. It's the complete opposite. He humbles them by bringing them together on one level, brothers. Notice the repetition of the word called, or the form of, of, of that word. Verse 8, not to be called rabbi. Verse 9, and call no man your father. Verse 10, neither be called instructors. Jesus is saying that his followers are not to be called anything special. There is only one word worth, there's only one who is worthy of that designation, God. Now watch how we see this. This is amazing how Jesus exalts God. When I say God, I mean the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's bringing all the crowd and his disciples down, humility, not exalting his disciples above anyone else. All of them are brothers. Who does he exalt? He exalts God, the Trinity. Look how he does it. Verse 8. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. John 14, verse 26. Let me read it to you. Who's the teacher? Now, pay attention. I'm going to read John 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Who's the teacher, the one teacher? Holy Spirit. Then look at, look at verse 9. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father. And who, who's he talking about? God the Father. Second per, right? that's, that's two of the three in the Trinity. Verse 10. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Who's the Christ? The Son. He exalts the Trinity... Holy Spirit, Teacher, Father, Father, Christ, Instructor. Not the disciples, not with a name, not with a title. Humility. He says, matter of fact, the greatest among you should be your servant. I mean, he talked about this back in Matthew 20. He said, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Jesus is saying that the person who is not seeking personal gain of any sort, but simply the opportunity to serve, is considered greater. Not interested in the title. You don't need to call me apostle. You don't need to call me instructor. Servant. Brother. He exalts humility. This is exactly the attitude he's, he doesn't see in the chief priests and the Pharisees. It's the opposite. They're interested in the titles. They're interested in the, man, the praises of men. And that's why he's rebuking them. And he lays into them at the, the rest of Matthew 23. And he sums it up here at the end of, Ma of, of chapter 12. This is, he sums up his warning by stating the inevitable outcome. This is where we're going. For those of us who exalt ourselves will be humbled. And for those who humble themselves, their outcome is more favorable. 
they will be exalted. And that, just think about it, that's the, that's the, that, is, that right there is the complete opposite from the world's perspective. The world's perspective is exalt yourself, right? Like, you go get it. Look out for number one. The one that humbles himself in the world gets run over. Jesus being the perfect picture of humbling oneself, right? Leaving heaven, setting aside that, which we can't even understand, coming to be beaten and then killed so that we could be forgiven. By faith alone in that work. It's the ultimate picture of humility, humbling oneself. It's not about titles. That's the issue that he has here with them. Let's read these verses one last time. Again, what we see, uh, we see Jesus exposing hypocrisy, 1 through 7, and then exalting humility. Verse 1, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, all of their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their flactories broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth. For you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors. For you have one instructor, the Christ. There's the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. He's exalting the Trinity. Verse 11, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, everyone in this room is guilty of everything the scribes and Pharisees are doing, have done, are doing in the text, every single one of us. Filthy, wretched, seeking the praises of men, loving those honored seats. Forgive us for that, Lord. Help us to be more humble. Help us to be like you, Lord. If we're desiring to, to be like you and to seek after you, the product of that, the result of that, of your work in our lives, is humility. So forgive us for, for exalting self. And Lord, we praise you for the grace and the mercy you extend to us. Having been bought by the blood, we love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.